Last week, we looked at the uh, first four verses, and there's a whole lot more in there. Uh, in fact, I was going to do today the second section in 1 John. The first one was sec the first section was verses one through four. The next section is the rest of the chapter, which is one through five through ten. But um, now it's going to take more than one message. So we're just looking at 1 John 1 5 today. And by the way, we've kind of talked about this a little bit a little bit ago, but um, this study is going to be whole milk as opposed to skim milk. And what I mean by that is that if we just stuck to the English, we would be getting skim milk. But if we dig deeper into what the actual words that John the writer used, and what they meant, what he meant by what he said and how he said it, this is one of the most simple examples of the Greek language in the Bible. This is, in the New Testament, this is the most simply written book. But John was a master of communicating, and he used specific words, and he used specific words forms of those words because he had a very specific message to, set, to share with us. And to get that, we have to spend some time looking at the original. So I'm not going to, it's not going to be a, a seminary lecture or anything, but this is going to be more of a Bible study than a, than a... And so if you have questions or comments, uh, I invite those, okay? But I want to make sure that we understand what we're reading here. So, oh, and by the way, in the very, I have to apologize. I, without thinking, I printed off the outline and forgot to make it print double-sided. That's why you've got two sheets and they're stapled together. I didn't want to, didn't want to waste ink or paper. So, uh, but that also gives you more room to write notes. <coughs> so, um, and and the reason I'm on the back page at the bottom, there's a note there. There, there's, you see a lot of things that are in brackets. That, those are from that source. Uh, I made a few modifications, but it's that's all primarily from from that scholarly work. I'm not, I am not by any stretch a super expert, fluent Greek reader. Uh, I did take three years of Greek, but. <laughs> that wasn't enough. So, um, this is not all coming just from me. Uh, this, we're using some stuff from the experts. But anyway, as we start, I wanted to do a quick review of what we looked at last week. What is that, in quotes? And, and it comes from, in the way the New English Standard Version starts, verse 1 says, that, which was from the beginning. And actually... Here's a case where it doesn't, it's hard to translate, but the word that we translate that is the exact same word, which as we get farther through, it says, which we have heard, it's, it's that same word, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, all those witches are the same word as that, that. And they all refer to who? Jesus. Jesus. That is Jesus. And so, understanding that, we have to understand three things about that, which we looked at. That, that is Jesus, is a person. He was a real person, a human being. He was here. He still is here. And He is coming back. He is here in the form of His Spirit, in each one of us, His disciples. So that is a person. That is eternal life. It says right there in verse, the end of verse 1, the end of verse 2, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we've seen it and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Now, who was made manifest to us? Jesus. Jesus. And he is referred to right there as the eternal life. He doesn't just give eternal life. He is eternal life. And then the last thing was that that is complete joy. John says in verse 4, we're writing these things so that your joy may be complete. 
He wants us to understand that when we experience Jesus Christ, when we are in Christ, when He is in us, we can experience complete joy. And of course, joy is not the same as happiness. That's a whole other series we're not going to get into right now. But we want to look today at verse 5, which is there. Let's read that verse. This is the message we've heard from you and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now there is a lot packed into this. First, that is the messenger. We have heard from him, it says there. We've heard from him, that is, Jesus is the messenger. He's the one who has brought this message. This is the message we've heard from him proclaim to you. So Jesus is the messenger. But that is also the message. He is the messenger, but he's also the message. Jesus is the message. Now we know this is what he's talking about here because this verse starts with the word this. You see that there? And in the Greek, the, that word is chi. Chi is, is a conjunctive. It's a word that connects two phrases or two thoughts together. And in this context, chi is referring to that. The that that is the first word in the book and is repeated when we translate which, this is referring straight back to that. So what we are what it is saying in verse 5 is continuing to be said about that which is Jesus. That is the message. The message in Greek, the word is angelia. Uh, sound like an wor English word at all? What does it sound like? Angel. There are places, especially in Paul, and in, in, um, in Acts, there's a story about uh, when Peter, well, forget about Paul for a minute, back in Acts, and talking about Peter, remember Peter and John were proclaiming Jesus in the in the in the temple and they got arrested and uh, they got let loose and then later on John was arrested again at the same time when they arrested James and they killed James, John's brother at that point and John was arrested and he was asleep between there was like two squads of four soldiers that were guarding John and he was asleep in prison one night and the uh, he was woken up it says the angel had to actually I don't know if he kicked him or punched him or what, but he, he, the angel, an angel came and woke him up. And had to do whatever it was that he did to wake him up. It said, get up and follow me. And it says the gates of the prison opened by themselves and he was let out. And the, anyway, and he went on his way and he didn't know what to do. And it wasn't until he was out on the street that he realized it wasn't a dream that he was, he had actually been delivered miraculously from prison. So he went to where he knew a bunch of the disciples were. And he knocked on the door. Remember this story? Mm -hmm. He knocked on the door, and, and the girl, the servant girl came, and she saw John, and she slammed the door and goes back to where all the group was, and she says, oh, John's at the door. That was Peter. Or Peter, I mean, not John. It was Peter. It was Peter. But anyway, he was at the door. Peter's at the door. And um, they go, no, no, he's still in prison. It can't be. It must be his angel. That's what it said. That's what they said. It must be his angel. And what they meant was it, it must be a messenger from John. Because they, they used the word, we, they didn't just use the word in refer, reference to heavenly beings, the angels, but also to messengers. And so, and you can see that that's where this meaning comes from because that is the message. The message here, the word is angelia, which is also the root is angel. Angels, messengers, the message is proclaimed by messengers or angels. 
And in fact, there were angels who were messengers. I mean, when, when the shepherds were out in their fields watching their flocks by night, it says the angels came and brought the message of good news. And it's all about Jesus. The message, that is the message. And that is the first thing that we see. That is the word of life. And that goes back to <clears throat> chapter, uh, verse 1, the very end of it. It's concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest. Jesus is the word of life. Then it says that we have heard. This is the message we have heard from him. Heard. That we heard. Akuo is the Greek verb. But John didn't say this is the message that we heard. The best way we can translate it is John, or is this is the message that we have heard. But that's still not exactly what John was saying. Um, Greek has a tense, a verb tense called the perfect tense. We have the perfect tense too, but this is just a little bit more specific. The perfect tense in the Greek expresses perfected action or perfected action. And what that means is that it, it talk, it's talking about an action that involves a present state which has resulted from a past action. In other words, something happened in the past and it's still happening. That's the perfect tense. Not, not the past tense, which is something happened back in the past. It's the perfect tense is something that happened in the past and is still happening. The present state is a continuing state. The past action is a completed action. And so we could write this, we could say this, expand this by saying we heard the entire message when Jesus first told it to us. And we continue to hear the message, and we will never stop hearing it. This is the message that we have heard from Him. This is the message. It still is the message. It will always be the message. It will never change. It is the message that we heard from Jesus. That is the messenger. And that is what we proclaim to you, that message. And again... That proclaim is another form of that same root. Proclaim is the verb anagelo, which if you look at it, you can see the root in there. The, you guys don't know. Anyway, I gave you guys, you can see the Greek letters there. That's what it looks like in Greek, and next to it is, is how we sound it out in English. But it is also a form of that word, the message. In other words, that which we, that this is the message we've heard from him, and we pass the message on to you. We are also messengers along with Jesus Christ. He is the message. He is the messenger. We as his disciples are also representing him, and we are also messengers. Remember in 1 first, first Corinthians, Paul said, um, God has given us the message of reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and we are proclaiming that message. We are continuing to share the same message, Jesus Christ, that Jesus came initially to share. So we proclaim... That is, we tell, we declare, we pass on to you what we have heard. So, what is the message? What is the message? Well, it's a couple things. First of all, the message is that, first of all, that God, and when he's talking here, he's referring back, John is referring back to chapter, verse 2, not chapter 2, verse 2, where he says, we proclaim it to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. In other words, God is both the Father and the Son. 
John fully understood that Jesus was God, as we read in, in John chapter 1 there in our scripture reading. In the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, the message is that God, the Father, the Son, and we can also say the Holy Spirit, even though He's not being referred to directly here. God is two things. One is something that He is and one that He is not. First is God is, the verse says, that God is light. This is the message we heard from you and from Him and proclaim to you that God is light. Have you ever thought about that? God is light. Without God, there is no light. Without God, there is no physical light. I mean, what was the very first thing on the first day of creation in Genesis chapter 1? Light. And God said, let there be light. light. Without God, there is no light. God is not just the bringer, a giver of light. He is the light. In Revelations, John, again, the same person, talks about how there is no sun in, in heaven because who's the light? Who provides all the light? God. God provides all the light. God is light. John said in the Gospel of John, didn't he? He said, God is love. Remember that? Um, as we go through the, this book of 1 John, we're going to see that the love and light are pretty much the exact same thing. God is light. And this is one case where the Greek word for light is basically identical to ours. It's light. Light is light. Phos. We get the words photosynthesis, photography, photos. All that stuff is from that Greek root word phos. But God is light. God is the source of all that is. Did I put that in here? Oh, it's on your notes though. God is the source of all that is. Without Him, nothing exists. We just read that in first in John, didn't we? All things, verse 3, John 1. All things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him, all things exist. Without Him, nothing exists. In God, think about this one. In God, there is no non-existence. That is, there's no darkness. That's what, the, what's what John just said here. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. There's no non-existence, no darkness. Darkness is what? Darkness is the absence of light, right? By default, you take the light away, what do you get? What do you get? Darkness. Dark. Yeah. If you bring light, what happens to the darkness? It goes away. It goes away. Darkness is nothing. Light is everything. God is everything. Darkness is the absence of light. And darkness, in the darkness, there is not God. In other words, where there's darkness, there is no God. God is not there. Because wherever God is... There's light. Because God is light. Right? So, that's the first thing. The message is that God is light. The second part of the message is, and in Him is no darkness at all. No darkness. Now, <clears throat> John uses the word darkness here, and he uses a a form of the word it's not the same as when he talks about darkness down in 
uh, verse 6, where it says, If we say we have fellowship with Him, we walk in the darkness. That's a different word. It's the same root, but it's a different word. He's saying something specific here. In Him is no darkness at all. The word is skodia, which is the word that the Greeks used when they talked about darkness in terms of darkness being a spiritual darkness, that is sin. There are places in the Bible where we, in English, translate this word skotia as sin. John, we translate it as darkness here because it fits in the context better, but, but he's referring figuratively to sin. And as I wrote, as it says here, figuratively with the associated idea of unhappiness or ruin. In other words, there's no, there's no unhappiness or ruin in, in the presence of God. And this is not what we just said, in ver, and John just said in verse 4. We're writing these things so that our, what? Your, our joy may be complete. complete. So darkness is the opposite of that. Darkness is the opposite of light. It has to do with unhappiness and death. This light is not only the emblem of happiness, but it is also itself beneficial. Darkness in like manner in the same way works unhappiness and death. And here's the point that's really important. Thus, scotia is not only a figurative term for sin itself, but also for the consequences of sin. Darkness refers to sin here, but it also refers to the outcome of sin. This is important to understand this, because we tend to think that sin is, sin is something that we do, which is true, sin is, but sin is a choice we make, isn't it? We choose to sin. But this, what John is saying here is that the outcome of sin is not something that God does to us. Sin and its outcome are the result of darkness. In other words, as I put it here, this is how I wrote it down. Sin and its outcomes do not result from God's actions. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, right? Romans 6, 23, I forget which. And we, we tend to think that death is something that is exacted upon us, right? by God and His justice. But what John is saying here is no. Sin and its outcomes do not result from God's action, but from the absence of God and His action. You take the light away and what do you get? Darkness. What is darkness? Sin and its outcome. Death, right? Separation from God. And there's no darkness in God. So God can't be the cause of the outcome other than the fact that he, only in the sense that when He removes Himself, the outcome is going to happen. Because it is in Him that we live and move and have our being, right? Mm -hmm. We exist because God keeps us in existence. We remove ourselves from God and we remove ourselves from light. We remove ourselves from that which keeps us alive and we step into darkness, that is, into death. Sin and its outcomes do not result from God's action, but from the absence of God and His action. Do you guys understand what I'm saying here? God did not make darkness. No, darkness is, darkness is the absence of anything. Darkness is not a thing. Right, it's so the absence of... It's, darkness is nothing. That's the thing. God's the spirit of God hovered over the waters, and the first thing that happened when God showed up was light. Mm -hmm. Dispelled the darkness. Yes. So, from from John's perspective, um, sin is something that results. 
It's the result of the subtraction of God from your life. It's, it's choosing to exclude God. We're going to get to that. Well, just, let's just keep going here because, first of all, let's go back. This is not a real long message, but it's an important one that we understand the message. Here's how I summarize it. That, which is Jesus Christ, is the messenger and the message. And the message is that God, the Son, Jesus, along with God the Father, is all light and no darkness. Isn't that what that's... Isn't that, you see where that's what John is saying in that verse? See, we have to spend time in the English... Um, Taking it apart and putting it all back together, and when we do, there's more to it, than, more words there than what John said, because John said all of that in his language, but it takes more for us to translate that uh, into English. So, John was saying more than what our English translation says. Hence, the whole milk as opposed to the skim milk. So that's that's the uh, summary of what. That's basically what John is saying in verse 5. That Jesus Christ is the messenger and the message. Jesus, God the Son, along with God the Father, is all light and no darkness. Now there's some things that we can conclude from this or deduct from this. A couple things that I think we should take home with us. First of all, God and darkness are mutually exclusive. Or we could say it, we probably should probably, you might want to put right over top of darkness, sin there. God and sin are mutually exclusive. Remember there's a verse that we've referenced a number of times from Isaiah that says your sin has caused a separation between you and your God. That's basically what John is saying here. God and darkness are mutually exclusive. God is light. Darkness is the absence of God. Where God is not, there is darkness. That's why John in the book of Revelation refers to um, outside the gates of the city there's, is where there's darkness, and there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, because God is not there. God is not there to counteract the forces of evil against us. And we're going to see that next week when we get into the last four verses of the chapter. To walk in darkness, and I'll just make mention of it because it fits here. To walk in darkness, and that's a different use, different form of the word darkness here. But to walk in darkness is to walk about naked and exposed. We can't see our enemy, and we are completely unprotected from him if we walk in darkness. Because God is not there to protect us. And so the outcome of sin just happens it happens because evil is out there, the enemy is out there, and God's not standing in between you and him, and he's going to do whatever he can to destroy you. Anyway, so God and darkness are mutually exclusive. As, as it said in our scripture reading today in verses 1, 4 and 5, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness. The darkness does not overcome it. In other words, where God shows up, darkness flees. When we let God in, when we ask God in through confession and repentance and seeking forgiveness, God comes in and darkness leaves. Sin leaves. So the second thing we can deduct from this is that to sin is to choose darkness rather than light. Or to choose sin rather than God. To exclude God from some part of our lives. John is fully aware that we have the freedom to make our own choices. And it is by our choice 
whether we allow light into our life or keep it out and continue to live in darkness. In fact, John made a big statement on this point in uh, John chapter 3. He said, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And John said it very specifically there, carried out in God. You could substitute and say, carried out in light. Because God is light. So this is the message that we heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. One last thing to say, even though I didn't put it in the notes. I guess I'm not going to say it. I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> It'll come to me next week, though. <laughs> uh, yeah. It is our choice whether we walk in light or in darkness. Whether we walk with God or apart from God. The consequences of our choice are dependent on whether God is watching over us and protecting us or whether we are walking naked and exposed to the enemy. Sin is a very real thing. Sin is our choice to do it or not to do it. I would encourage us to not do it. To go to God and say, Lord, come in. Shine your light in my life. Shine your light on this part of my life that I have been... In other words, Lord, there's a closet over there that I've kept shut so that you can't get your light in there. But that is ultimately going to ruin me if I continue to do that, to keep that door shut. So I'm opening the door. Shine your light into every aspect of my life. Take all sin away. That's what God wants to do. John says Jesus in the vision he had in Revelation in uh, chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, fellowship with him and he with me. Open the door and let the light in. That's what God wants us to do. And we have to make the conscious choice every day. Lord, Shine your light into my life. Shine your light through me into the lives of others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you are our everything. Truly, you are the center of it all. You are the source of everything. Apart from you, we are nothing. Apart from you, we are ruined and destroyed. Lord, may there be nothing in our lives to separate us from your light, from your presence. Lord, when there is something you show us, may we be quick to confess it and repent and let you be in control. Let you shine your light on that thing and free us from that sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh.